everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and I am in Schaumburg, Illinois, just about a mile from the Renaissance Convention Center where Brickworld Chicago is held. But today we're here to check out Blocks to Bricks, this brand new uh, museum that we have here. And I have the creator of the museum with me, Adam Reed Tucker, and we're going to talk about kind of the inspiration museum and then give you guys a look inside here to see what all you can check out when you visit. So thanks so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. This is kind of my my version of really capturing the essence of what three-dimensional creativity is. And so uh, this is a museum, but it's an art gallery type setting. Hopefully um, this is going to be community based to where um, this is a platform for um, maybe artists that won't have the opportunity to be a headliner at say the Museum of Science and Industry or the National Building Museum, things like that. So there'll be um, invitations here for artists in all different mediums. My first exhibit 10 years ago was on vertical architecture skyscrapers and I wanted to challenge myself to now tell a story about engineering. So I did about 12 pieces. Um, there were cutaways uh, in most cases so you can actually learn about the Golden Gate Bridge, the Hoover Dam. In this case this is Ping An which is in Shanghai, China and it's a I believe it's a finance center. It's been a few years since I worked on this one, but this one is uh, supposed to demonstrate the anatomy of construction, okay? And I thought it would be a nice centerpiece for opening, and this will be a nice area because we'll be able to take this down and feature other artists' work or sculptures um, as a draw in. And then we have an interactive wall back here, which is, um, since we do have a soft opening, there are realities, so some things are not timed right, but uh, these are interactive walls. Um, obviously, wow. this is not three dimension, okay, but this is really supposed to um, evoke a, a curiosity and a mystery. So when you come in here and you see what's being called the UFO and you see this wall and it almost looks like we're on the bridge to a Star Trek <laughs> Enterprise, right? But it's really supposed to be something that's a unique, we're a small museum here, so I wanted it to be unique. And over here you've got these tubes full of bricks and everything, so the, the Lego aspect hits you right away. Yeah, we're, so here's the lobby area. and. Um, people that know me, I am uh, secretly a huge fan. Um, I have two, I'll, I have a few role models, but two of them are, one is fictional, one is non-fictional. So Walter Linus Disney, who was, uh, I, I studied him immensely in college in terms of the person. Um, not so much the movies and the parks, but him as a thinker. And then um, another whimsical role model of mine is uh, uh, Gene Wilder's role as Willy Wonka in the original 1971 Willy Wonka the Chocolate Factory and so I tried to embrace um, some of their characteristics both Walt's and uh, and Willie's if you will uh, in this museum because you know I wanted it to be a little whimsical and fun and you know that's what it's about you know it's about an escape. That's a great introduction to start taking a, a more in-depth look at the museum and you've got this great overview right here, so you can kind of take us through what we're going to be seeing here. Yeah, so the, the idea here was um, nothing like this has really been done before, so it's kind of a hybrid, like I said, art gallery inspired museum experience. My staff here, I didn't want them having to recycle every five minutes, what is this place? Because no one, even me, I still am figuring out what this place is. It's hard to define yeah. always. It is. So I figured, what not a better way than to have a map? and to illustrate what you are about to see and experience. And so, um, so here's where we're actually standing right now, lobby area, and then um, you'll get your tickets uh, to what we're calling a pre-show theater experience. It's about a four minute video, which we'll show you guys in a few minutes. And then you enter into, this area is, is what we're calling Adam's story. So this is how did I get my start, which is probably not too unlike many other people start who are creative or AFOLs or whatever, um, where you actually influenced at a very young age. And then I have my high school work, my college work, my professional work, and then some of my Lego work in there. Just so people who aren't familiar with what I'm trying to do as an ambassador to the brick. Um, so that sets the stage. And then you start entering into one of 13 zones. We go into stone. Um, and we have some sets from the 1800s in here. And then we go into wood, where we have some early 1900 sets and some of the very first uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. His son actually invented Lincoln Logs. We actually have some of his sets here in the museum. And then we go into metal, and then we go into paper, and then we go into plastic, and then early brick, and then this is all the Lego brick. And then we have this really cool experience within the Lego brick zone called the Glow Dome, which we will get a sneak peek at. Um, and then here, um, uh, I would be remiss if we didn't also acknowledge that there are other companies out there making bricks. Now, I have a very strong stance on that, okay? Um, 
a lot of companies are referred to as clone bricks, okay? Well, I think it's important to make a designation between clone bricks and copycat bricks. Um, for legal reasons, I'm not going to name names, okay? But there are companies out there that I will absolutely not support in this museum because they are obviously plagiarizing, and we all know who they are. They're just um, basically ripping off existing they, Lego they sets. Are, they are, they are. Um, but then there are other companies that when the patent expired on the Lego brick, um, it became public domain. There are companies that are at least doing their own original content. And we actually make bricks, and then there's a conveyor belt and a robotic arm that come out and follows down here. And then we have 88 tubes, which you alluded to earlier, which we'll get to look at later, where we'll actually be making, every other day, we'll be making a brand new color that's based on the Pantone color system. So as a designer, that's, that's a very important aspect of color and their shape and form and all this. But um, we were, you know, at least I was, I was taught using the Pantone color system. Um, and as a designer, um, you know, Lego can only produce so many colors because they've got so many different elements. Um, but there's millions of colors out there. And so I thought it would be wonderful to, to slowly fill those voids. Again, that's meant as a souvenir, not to make bricks and sell them on, you know, websites or that sort of thing. It's just, it's supposed to be an added experience when you're here. And then um, lastly, we have a model shop here. So we will be having artisans rotating every week. Um, so invitations have gone out to some local lugs and we're actually looking at, instead of hiring a full-time model builder, we're actually thinking about it being almost like um, an artist of the week or an artist of the month and celebrating a lug and maybe they're 20 members and they come in and they get to demonstrate and be a part of this because I really want this to be a community feel. Well, after all that, I'm even more excited to go inside, yeah, so let's so go we'll ahead and head on in. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's a taste of the introductory movie that you see when you first come into the museum. Uh, projects onto the floor as well and creates a awesome experience to introduce you to the whole museum. So I hope you enjoyed the theater. Um, this, so this is that first little area I told you about, Adam's story, and this is really just kind of jumpstart your experience to kind of let you know what inspired me. And, and I think it's important to start with your influences from your childhood, and a lot of people probably um, will relate to some of this, but this was actually, uh, a, it was called a Take Apart Toolbox, and it was from a company that's no longer around called the Child Guidance Toy Company. Um, this was a toolbox that gave you the tools to take apart the toolbox, and I was just so enamored by it. I think I got it when I was the age of four, and so that is actually my original set that my parents gave me. Um, and then moving along here, you could see Playmobil was was actually a huge influence um, on my creativity and my role playing before I could get to, to Lego bricks. And I don't believe they were um, readily available either um, as they are now in the States back you know, in the early 1970s. Um, obviously later on in the 1970s, um, they became much more readily available because my favorite line, which we will get to, and I will, I will share that when we get to the Lego area. But so Playmobil was huge. And then here over here, some of my, my high school and college work. Um, so I did everything by hand. So it was all model making using wood, paper, uh, metal, and um, no computers back you know, in the 19, early 1990s. Um, and so these are, obviously we're missing a lot of signage right now. That'll be up to explain all of this sort of thing. And um, you can see we have shelves that obviously need stronger magnets because these have, you know, but these are the growing pains of opening up yeah, a museum. Yeah, I mean, beginning stages here and you kind of evolve over the, over the coming months. And then this, uh, and then the end here shows uh, my last year of being a professional architect uh, before I started um, getting exposed to the Lego brick. So that kind of rounds out. I'll have some more influences on that. And then here's the first Lego set I ever received from my aunt, who was a civil engineer. This was in 1981 or 82, I believe. And then there's some of the, the, the models that I had uh, worked on uh, with the Lego group. Mm -hmm. And so really that's just a taste, kind of a little brief history, which we'll, we'll do more. But here is a, a good example of what each of the, um, the building sections will look like. So we'll have some signage here, um, very simplistic, nothing to make you fall asleep, just to give you a brief understanding about the history of stone. And then we have a little video here that shows some inspirational images. Um, 
and basically kind of how we as human beings are inspired um, to use stone in everyday creativity. And obviously we need to hide cords and we need to make sure that you know things disappear and you know on the screen but um, and then here's a rock collection um, and it's interesting to teach people about what's the difference between elements and minerals and rocks and stones and all that so we want to kind of also um, be responsible as a museum to kind of educate um, people of all ages to understand that hey rock come in many forms um, and um, and then so that's that that'll be kind of a taste of each section we'll have kind of a of a prehistory lesson and um, all of the sets and all of the exhibits are arranged chronologically so here we've got some sets from the early 1800s uh, middle 1800s um, these are very rare they're very fragile um, but this actually is very important in telling the story about three-dimensional mm -hmm. creativity and then as you can kind of tell graphically as we move through the decades um, in the years you know you could start to see when color started becoming into print and um, I mean, some of these sets are amazing. Like here, this one, Toy Crete, and the one just next to it, Cement, cement Block Machine, where there's actually a, we call these a CMU, um, and those are actual blocks that you actually make with your own mixture and a press. So it was, it was bad enough that some companies didn't give you the bricks, but you had to make your own bricks. You were like before making you concrete blocks yourself. I mean, it's crazy, <laughs> right? But look, you actually had to mold and wow. mix your own cement before you could make bricks. And obviously, there's companies that started making the bricks for you. So then you could just, um, and there's kind of a, a little instructional, which is kind of very visually interesting on in how you can recreate the pyramid, mm -hmm. you know, in that case. And then we get into the 50s and 1960s. And... Like anything else, life is cyclical, right? And so now these sets that look like they're old are actually remakes of sets from 200 years ago. So, um, so things kind of always seem to come back into fashion. Um, and so all of the, these fascinating kind of kits we've looked at here, were these from companies based in the United States or where were a lot of these companies I, based that... I am not prejudiced. So I've been collecting these sets so... For the last 10 years, I started collecting, and I've got about 32,000 sets in our archives. Um, there's only about 10% of them up at any one time because we want to revolve and refresh all of the exhibits. And then also, I just don't have the room for all these. But eventually, we will have about twice as many sets. Um, the white walls, we still have some shelving that need to go in and that sort of thing. But these are from all over the world, okay. to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, it's just about exposing and more so the idea behind this museum was to preserve these artifacts that aren't being recognized in major museums throughout the world to no fault of their own you know they're they've got you know dinosaur collections and jewel collections and things that are hundreds of years old preserving you know mummies from Egypt I mean those are what we think of when we talk about museums um, but I think a hundred years from now it's going to have been nice for someone to have preserved these what I'm calling modern era artifacts of human culture um, so future generations can enjoy kind of this journey about man's creativity yeah mm -hmm. so this next area here minus the sign um, and a TV that is um, is not functioning right now but this is the woods so just like stone um, this will have um, every species that I can get my hands on of wood and what are the different properties so I think it would be interesting for people to know what's the difference between maple and chestnut and what are they used for um, what were Lincoln logs were, were Lincoln logs just made out of cedar or redwood you know what you know mm -hmm. so and then these are some very early wood sets um, that we have here on display um, and it, it's really interesting stuff if you take a few minutes to stop and look and actually get into the instructions and you actually see, you know, what was important in terms of construction. Because this is, you got to remember, all of this is pre-AutoCAD, right? Um, so this is how um, not even kids, but honestly professionals used to come up with designs, um, you know, for, for building. So. It is really fascinating to look at these and kind of obviously the, the context a lot of us will have is kind of Lego sets that we grew up with and kind of modern Lego instructions and stuff. And so you look at wood and stone sets and stuff in that context and see right. some of the similarities and differences there. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and here's some more. Um, just They're just fascinating to, to kind of study and try and find the history of them and catalog that, again, to preserve, to preserve all of this. You know, this is part of our culture, so I think mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And then here's actually one of our, one of our artists um, 
who doesn't really play or build with Lego. Um, he doesn't like the feel of metal, so he doesn't use erector sets. Um, but his thing is Lincoln Logs. He loves Lincoln Logs. So we, we found this gentleman, and uh, this is one of his creations. And obviously, if you take about you know, 20 Lincoln Log sets, um, you can create this yourself. But here we actually have some very, this is some of the very early Lincoln Log sets. These are the very first ones that came out in 1920, 1923. Wow. And uh, this was all invented by John Lloyd Wright, who is the son of famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, we're very fortunate to have uh, a few of his sets here in our collection. And then Lincoln Logs come in so many shapes and sizes behind you. We actually have a, um, we actually have some interactives here where you can push on these domes and uh, you can actually see all of the different types of companies that made in this case, this is celebrating Play School as a manufacturer. So Play School did Lincoln Logs and stacking blocks and letterwood blocks and village role-playing play sets and you, you name it. So, um, but yeah, and then, you know, there's, uh, there's some sets here too from our, our northern friends here. There's some Canadian logs, <laughs> which, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, and then these are actually from... Um, uh, Disney. Uh, these are Walt Disney's um, Lincoln Log sets back from the 1950s and 60s. Um, those are pretty rare and pretty pretty hard to find in good condition. And then they come in lots of different sizes too. I think I've got Lincoln Logs here in I think seven different sizes. This one over here is pretty cool because these are almost like we have Duplo, right? Mm -hmm. Well, these are big wood lumber. <laughs> so these are oversized or jumbo Lincoln Logs. Um, which I, I kind of find humorous. And then obviously you've got some really small ones here, um, which are kind of cute, I guess you could say. And, um, and then, yeah, it just goes through all different types of wood-based um, construction sets. And then over here as well, um, some, some interesting ones. And then different types of what we call canister sets, um, tinker toys. Um, so, you know, here's an interesting one that someone came up with. Um, here's one from Israel. Yeah, actually, that's amazing. Jerusalem. The Jerusalem city build. Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's just amazing. I mean, a lot of the stuff you don't know is out there and then you start collecting it and you start seeing like, wow, we, we have a, a rich history of products that have helped inspire human beings to be creative. Now, I will have to make a special call out to this set here. This is called the Satellite City Set. I don't have my keys on here, but right at the moment to open up this and show you. But this is a gentleman that owned a furniture manufacturing plant. Specifically, he created lathes and he was dowels for, for legs of chairs and tables. Well, he had a tremendous amount of scrap. Now, back then, there wasn't recycling programs mm -hmm. like today. So what did this guy do? If you open up this box, and we should, we will have this box open on display, but what this guy did was he repurposed all of the overages and shortcuts and runs and put it in a box with some paint. And so if you paint all of them red, you can make a Martian landscape. <laughs> I mean, how obscure, right? Yeah. It's the, I've never seen that before. There's a, a bunch of other experts in this area that I have shown that to. And they said that is the most obscure set. Um, but it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, you got to love it, right? Yeah. What a great idea to just take the extra scrap stuff and, and create building stuff out so of it. So here we enter into metal. Um, so this is all about, essentially, it's erector-based, okay? Um, so here we actually have the very first, I believe, um, wood-boxed set for erector. Um, that's probably the prized set in this collection. Then we've got some other early sets. So this is the American uh, model builder set that uses metal. Um, and then we do have some other interactives. I, I don't know if this one's working. I think it's probably jammed, of course. But if you rub your hand over these sensors, um, we do have some artifacts. So here an artist made some interactive marble machines, almost like what we have GBC, yeah. of course. So these are glass marbles that run through a course. Um, and when you go through, we'll have about 30 of these sensors um, and you just wave your hand. We've set it back because it's jammed, obviously, but when you activate it, these will turn on for about a 30 second time. Um, so you can actually see how some of these work. These are some early sets from AC Gilbert from the 1920s. Um, this is amazing that we've got some of these in our collection here. And um, 
Yeah, and then we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of paper memorabilia as well uh, to really with ads. You know, today you know magazines and newspapers. I mean, there are a lot of magazines, which is great because I I'm a huge fan of magazines and publications. But a lot of these, um, since we're going to the digital with everything now, a lot of this this is going to be lost one day. And so here we're going to have some old advertisements up, um, so you can actually see. And then here's a copy of the Saturday Evening Post which shows uh, man's achievement, um, you know, with, with steel at that time. And here's some more sets here. And then we enter into the next area, which is about paper. And a lot of people are probably like, paper? How do you use paper to be creative? Well, there's actually a lot. So this is actually my personal collection from the 1980s. Um, I actually remember building a lot of these with my father. Um, you do have to be skilled to make them. You have to cut everything out and glue them. And, um, and that takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, and a lot of skill. Um, actually, there is, here's a set, a Harry Potter castle that's uh, a build your own that I was able to find. And so, again, this is about all different mediums. Um, there is a company out there um, that does a lot of um, Ravensburger. Uh, they do a lot of these, they call them 3D puzzles, where they're kind of thin foam. Um, and you're able to create um, or recreate, I guess, uh, different landmarks throughout the world. And yeah, so, so that was paper. I know it's brief, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Then uh, one of the larger sections is obviously plastic. Um, so over here, we'll have some information about plastic and all the different plastic properties and things like this and, um, and the forms they come in. And then just so many sets. I love this line, this, this, it's called Skyline as an architect. I never played with this because this was from the 60s. Obviously, I wasn't around at that time, but, um, but this is just brilliant because it's actually how real buildings are put together. Now, I do remember these when I was younger. Um, I played with both of these, these straw sets, which is interesting. It's called Construct Straws. Um, and you actually had connectors and inside they just gave you a bunch of colored drinking straws <laughs> And you got to make all these creations and then these other ones called crystal climbers. I do remember that um, I actually have a set that's not on display called play plaques and they were another company that made these translucent colored Panels that fit, you know intertwine and then here's an interesting. I'm still trying to get the history on Fisher Technic This is a European based um, and it's interesting because the the original expert builder line from Lego um, came out around the same time that Fisher Technic started coming out. Um, I believe this was all in the late 70s, early 80s, that sort of time period. I'm still getting some of the, my facts on this, but over here is an example of one of the models that Fisher Technic uh, produced, and it's this old steam tractor, and um, that's an amazing experience to put that set together. It's a lot of fun, and then this was my original Sears Tower set from Girder and Panel. Now, it's obviously a condensed version of the Sears Tower, which is now the Willis Tower, but this was uh, Kenner, Girders and Panels, and over here we have some examples of those sets. Um, and this is actually based on columns and girders and then the curtain wall system of how a building goes together, and that's the original box there showing that so. so it's very much trying to get that idea of you know how buildings are constructed across and getting that you know on kind of a much younger level but it still gives you the idea of how it all comes right. together right yes absolutely because when i wanted to build a sears tower when i was about eight years old i didn't have enough lego bricks to actually make you know because it's brick by brick you know <laughs> over here we've got some fun things so um this was a set from the 60s that's you really can't see but this is called Astrolite, I believe, and it just comes to life in a dark room. So we'll, you know, soft opening. We've got problems to, to solve. Um, this over here is Kinex, um, and there are people that are just really fond of Kinex, which I wasn't aware of. I've never played with it myself or used it for creations, but um, this is the artwork of Greg Noose, who actually happens to be a uh, model builder over at Legoland, believe it or not. Um, and this is one of his uh, side hobbies uh, that he, he got into before he got into Lego bricks. He's an amazing guy, um, great guy. And here I can show you that all of his, he has obviously an affinity towards amusement park rides. And so here on display, we're lucky enough to celebrate his work. And um, yeah, so those yeah, are, those these are, are great. All, mo all moving here at once. That's incredible. This is pretty interesting. This is a build-it-yourself children's um, 
it's like a scooter, I guess you could say, but you actually put it together and um, it's amazing. This is a crane. This, um, I actually don't know why this box is in here. Um, so we'll, we will have to take care of that, but um, that's an interesting piece from the 1960s. Huh. So it's build your own bike. And then here we, we have um, one of Connects's, um, this was actually one of their pieces that they did um, for when they were promoting um, the Connect system. And uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a pretty neat piece. And here's some more sets here. This one's really interesting. It's called Ramagan, and it's a system of using um, ball joints effectively. Um, Deodecan, I don't even know what the, it, someone's gonna know it out there. Um, but there are three dimensional balls that have, I think, 18 faces on them and then you can kind of plug in these rods and panels and create you know a city from the future right? <laughs> and then over here is um this is one of our sponsors here um one of the interesting things about this is we're a non-for-profit museum here and um, we do need help um this costs a lot of money to run and operate mm -hmm. so we do have sponsors um one of the the mandates that i have put in the museum as the chairman and also on the board of directors is that um, we, are, we are not going to be doing any overtly advertising, okay? If there's relevant products in here that are, are doing things to expand three-dimensional creativity, then we will give them a spot to celebrate some of the things that they do. And so here um, is Snap Circuits, and it's really interesting because here you get to learn about electricity um, through the art of play with snapping together circuitry. And so if I Go well, like this, you could see all of the different things that um, you can do. And here they've put together a nice little display to show how you've got lights and you've got, you could see the gauges on these NAND gate oscillators. Um, you have counters, you have current uh, dividers. So this is again, in my opinion, this is three dimensional creativity, um, mm -hmm. but just maybe not in the traditional sense that we think of with mm -hmm. Lego bricks or with Lincoln logs. Um, here's some really interesting sets. This is one that's for professional architects. It's called Archikit. And um, this is really, um, this just has came out uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And this is, I believe this gentleman is from Sweden or Norway. Um, and we're here um, with a few of his models. And I believe we have some of his sets in the gift shop too. And this kind of rounds out plastic. And then here we enter into early brick, which will be completely fleshed out with over 450 predecessor sets to the Lego brick, wow. which excites me because I, there is a rich history mm -hmm. there. Obviously or not obviously, Hillary Page was uh, credited with the dimensions of the brick. Um, obviously, Lego did a lot of things to improve it, like the tubes as we know, the clutch fitting, uh, the plates, the mini fit. I mean, I could go on and on and on, right? But um, that right there in the corner is what I was told was the very first Hillary Page design before he even came out with the brick um, for the automatic binding brick. Um, and so eventually I will have all of the narrative up here to understand his influence. And then throughout here, there's a lot of interesting Lego sets that probably no one's ever seen before. Those are, those are rods with holes. Um, so I have really an amazing collection. I've been lucky enough that I've befriended a lot of people in Germany um, on the other side of the pond who have a lot of this history stowed away and we're just looking for a place um, to to be able to show it off and so mm -hmm. um, here we will do that so this is about 10% of what I have for the early brick and I think this will be one of the most exciting areas yeah this part definitely uh, really excites me because I think it's very important to know that kind of historical context and how those bricks evolved over the years uh, to how you know where we have Lego today and how we got to where we are today so I think understanding that will be very beneficial yeah I I think it'll be interesting too and I think um, you know if uh, if you don't know what your history is, uh, you know, how can you move forward without knowing what happened behind you? And so I think also it's important to give credit where credit is due. And, you know, Hillary Page is no longer obviously with us, but he was a gentleman with an idea. So he came up with the X, Y, and Z dimensions, um, obviously came up with the two by four brick stud pattern. Um, but, you know, it didn't work really well. Um, uh, it, it really 
did not fit well. And then um, I believe it was old Kirk and Godford when, when they were exposed to the Kitty Craft Company and saw that brick, um, they had ideas of improving, obviously, their history with wood carving and toys and the pull. And we, all, we know all of those stories, but you know, they were looking to, to do something different because they suffered a lot of fires um, from their workshops. And then obviously they wanted to be on the cutting edge of children's creative play. And so, um, so they obviously um, adopted and worked with Hillary Page and Kittercraft to improve that brick and then eventually um, acquire it and the full rights to do so and then take it and improve it to be the brick that we all know and love today. So now we're, um, we're standing now at about 50% of the museum. So to get your bearing, we have traveled through about 50%. Okay. So the remaining 50% is composed of just Lego and then at the end that design lab that I spoke about earlier. So here is really, I'm gonna be honest with you, we staged all of this starting last Monday which was about four days ago prior to Brickworld because we wanted this to be ready for the Brickworld attendees to come because a lot of them travel long distances to come to Chicago, probably won't be back for another year. And so a lot of this is just staged so you get the essence and the idea of the storytelling, but I will be going back through this and pretty much redoing everything. Um, it's great that we have two yellow castles, but we really don't need two yellow <laughs> castles on display, right? So it's things like that that I, you know, there's probably another set that could take that space up that we, we probably omitted. Um, but this goes through um, the early years. Um, it goes through the Samsonite years. It goes through the, 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 the hobby sets, um, which we have a few on display. All of the, the sets that were pre even the straight minifigure and then in my opinion um getting into the the rich age of lego and um you know it's it's hard to compete with you know your modern consumer who's all ip driven you know and that's the direction of where not just lego but every company whether it's hasbro whether it's whatever everyone has to chase those ips and i and i get that but for me in terms of creativity I think the, the 80s, and maybe I'm being a little nostalgic here too because I grew up with these sets, so keep that in mind, but I think that there's a richness here that really to me is, um, is something that I'm trying to, to spotlight here. And no, this that's de definitely true. I mean, just, just uh, I think some of these sets you look at, definitely classics and some incredible sets here. And I always have to give a shout out to Fort Legorado. That's my personal favorite Lego set that Lego has ever made. I grew up playing that countless hours with that in the Western sets. So some of these sets are, are definitely incredible. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, not to get off topic here, but I, I think um, the reason why maybe to, you know, I'm 46 years old, you know, I think to anyone that's, you know, 30 years and older, maybe between 30 and 50, there, there is, we have to be careful because there, there is a nostalgia to it. So we are a little biased, but I think there's also something with you know, it's like now the sets are getting so realistic, right? And it's amazing. And I've noticed in a lot of the events that I do and the, the, the volunteer I do at schools and, and so on and so forth, and the kids don't want to take the sets apart. They're either afraid to lose a part or, and, and I don't blame them. The sets are amazing that these designers come up with. But, you know, back then, I think the fact that they relied a little bit on your imagination to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's because of a time when we grew up is different than kids now where they're used to the instant gratification. They're, they're seeing things on their iPhones and iPads and, and everything needs to be realistic and you know, it's got to be everything is on demand, this, that, and the other. And I don't know, maybe there was a time where maybe this will come back and who knows. But my favorite, so yours is Lego Rado. So my favorite is Classic Space. Um, I still think to this day that, and I am being biased, that's fine, but to me this is the most, I'm going to say rich line in my experience, and what I mean by that is there's just something about the simplicity, I'm a big fan of mid-century modern uh, design, and here one of the interesting things is it's just blues and the translucent yellow and then the old gray, and it's like nothing I had ever seen before, you know, and obviously this is 1978, 1979, and we'd already been to the moon. We know what rockets look like, but this was, you know, this wasn't, this was just, I don't know. I just can't explain it, but the classic space is just, 
to me, it will always hold a dear place in my heart. And then some of the other space lines that followed in the 80s and early 90s are just amazing. Um, you start looking at, you know, the black and the neon trans yellow, and then you get to, you know, I believe this is Black Tron 2, where it's now, it's not the neon yellow, but it's, you know, it's trans yellow, and then you get into M-Tron, and um, you know, it's just amazing. You know, you get Ice Planet over there, and then you got Spirus, and you've got UFO, and then you get to the original Space Police, and then obviously Life on Mars came um, in the 2000s, I believe. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think it's neat to see all of this stuff. Yeah, definitely, and, yeah. And then we've got two monorails here, which I don't know why they're here. So we'll, we'll be... Uh, That's the monorail. You can never have too much of that. Well, you can, I think we have like six sets, actually. And one of the nice things is, is we only need one set on display here. The other sets, what we're going to do is we're going to be making sure all the parts are correct. And we'll actually, almost like BrickLink, we will have a, almost a BrickLink-type store where you can come here. And let's say you do come through here, and there's a set you remember from your childhood, and you're like... Wow, I want to have that. Well, maybe they don't know about BrickLink, okay? Maybe they're not an AFL. Well, in our gift shop, like I said, we're not going to be selling any modern or contemporary LEGO sets that LEGO is currently selling, but maybe someone can come by here and pick up a complete monorail set in our gift shop. So, mm -hmm. so that's what we're going to do with a lot of our duplicate stuff. Now, this is all of the expert builder and technic, and, um, yeah, it's just amazing to see the progression of, you know, here's an expert builder helicopter set from probably 79, 78, and then just seeing, you know, a set next to it, a Technic set next to it, or the tow truck here, and being like, wow, what a difference, <laughs> you know. And then we, uh, I just picked up the, uh, the barcode machine that w came out by Technic uh, maybe 10 years ago, huh. where it actually reads bo uh, barcodes to actually program it. So that was before, like, things like, um, uh, power functions and Mindstorms and NXT and mm -hmm. EV3 and that sort of thing. Um, and then here's an artist um, who created a huge, uh, this is a, a probably an open mine pit, uh, not a drag line, but probably a, you know, a shovel. And uh, so that's, that's pretty amazing to see and it all works too. Um, but I just, I love celebrating what, you know, what our artists do because mm -hmm. I could never do something like that. <laughs> and then over here we've got some city and town, and um, we do have the work of Ryan Howitter, who uh, debuted this last year at Brickworld. Yeah. And I asked him what his plans were for this, and it just was very striking to me. You know, it's kind of a Martian colony, if you will. He will be able to explain it much better. And we have proper signage up. He will have his explanation there with his name accredited, of course. But um, it's just that was obviously a new color, I believe, came out in the. Uh, he told me it was a Star Wars land speeder, I think, last year. And he probably bought about 400 of those <laughs> to, to get the landscape down. But it's, uh, it's neat to see how these artists come up with these creations. And, you know, this. This museum is here to celebrate them. This was actually one of my very first Technic set, or expert builder sets. Um, and this was the first, the, very, the first auto chassis. There were two auto chassis sets. So this was one of the first ones. And that's what you got. You got no skin. So it was, again. There's a lot of studs there. <laughs> there were, well, and this is where you had to kind of take your imagination. Was this a sports car? Was it a sedan? Obviously, with the, the back seat there, it was, I don't know what it was. But, <laughs> um, but it, it's cool nonetheless. And then, obviously, over here, we've got uh, our transportation section. So we've got some airplanes and cars. And, um, yeah, we've, so we've got that kind of section. And then over here, we've got. Um, we've got uh, Fabuland and we've got mm -hmm. Belleville um, to pay homage um, and uh, yeah just to again it's just to to kind of show people the history and then if we sneak over into this room here this is what we're calling the glow dome and we literally just got this about four days ago so we'll rotate this is the the tower and in here will be creations. We're celebrating um, in, the, in here the work of Barbara Hewell from mm -hmm. Wisconsin. Um, her and me became friends a, a couple of years ago. I was really inspired by her creations. And um, they almost remind me of the bioluminescence from the movie Avatar. So she takes really odd and 
unusual elements that react to black light or UV light. And she makes these amazing creations. Um, and so I think that's important to, to show that um, Lego artists, in this case, since we're in the Lego area, come in all genders and all ages and all levels of creativity. Mm -hmm. And so here we've got a permanent, I literally built this room for her. Um, hopefully one day we'll also be able to celebrate other people's creations, but um, it's great. Here's some Bionicle pieces that um, I have a tough time appreciating Bionicle because it's, in my opinion, it's, it's not part of the system, right? Mm -hmm. But it's amazing what the Lego fans come up with, repurposing parts from all different lines. I'm even sure people use uh, Galador parts for things, you know. Um, and then one other interesting thing behind us is um, we have a series of these portholes. So again, to help people get an understanding about what this museum is like, actually people on the other side there, um, that's the mall. So as people are walking by, they can poke their head in and get a sneak peek to see what is what is this place like? So, um, so yeah. So we have some some of those things throughout the museum to help try to to get people a, a good visual. And then on this wall, this is our longest solid continual wall in the entire museum. And this is based um, primarily. Uh, it was designed in part to display all of the IP. Okay. So this is obviously Star Wars. It's got Harry Potter, and then it's got some of the other lines that didn't have as many sets, like The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and then you get into the Marvel lines, um, or Batman, um, superheroes, things of that nature. Um, Simpsons, Speed Racer, um, you know, Toy Story, SpongeBob, Sim you know, so, and then behind me um, is a wall that when it's done, um, the intent of this is to house every single known element that the Lego group has made. Not in every color combination, mm -hmm. because that would take up the size <laughs> of the museum. But here's just, again, we just threw this together just so um, the attendees during Brick World could kind of see what the space is going to be used for. But I believe there's about 14,000 maybe different elements that have been produced from, I think, 1949 through the present. And hopefully we'll be able to to have one of every single type here on display. At least that's what we're aiming to achieve. Yeah, okay. that's, that's great yeah. to just kind of at a glance see the crazy variety of elements that LEGO has released. Now this last section is kind of the miscellaneous section. We're calling it the minifigure madness area, okay? Um, the reason for that is this is our largest porthole out from the mall. And, um, you know, this does have to run like a business. Mm -hmm. And so even though I <clears throat> ashamedly admit this area has nothing to do with creativity, that's not entirely true, and I'll get to that in a minute. But essentially, when you look through there and you see our seven-foot-tall classic space minifigure built by Stefan out in Australia, um, he was kind enough to to let us have this on display here, and you could take your photo with it. Mm -hmm. And then the wall over here that's completely empty will have we'll be showcasing there um, a collection of 7,000 minifigures, every single minifigure that's ever been made to a degree. So we don't have all of the employee minifigures. I mean, there's some obscure things right. like that, but I think we've got probably 98% of every minifigure ever made. And it'll be cool because it'll almost be like a physical checklist. You could come here and you can actually see which minifigures you have or you don't, or you, oh my gosh, I forgot about that one. And then, um, the rest of this will be exclusives, interesting items like Lego Education. Um, a colleague of mine um, did this set here. He's a, he's a Lego certified professional. Um, we've got some early design by me sets, which a lot of people probably forgot about, which was before factory. Um, and then we've got some 3D printed classic spacemen there. So this is gonna be kind of the odds and, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of Lego ideas will be down here. And then we'll have the, 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 the modules here, the, the, uh, the city All modular, the modular buildings. buildings. Yep, yep, yep. And um, yeah, so that rounds out Lego. And then this last glass case here will house all of the Lego creatures that won't fit with the minifigures. So these will be all the, the dragons and the Jabba's and you know, anything that's just a, a creature, mm -hmm. you know. And then here is the, um, the section that I was talking about earlier, this is about 
uh, celebrating other companies that are at least doing their own original content. So that is the criteria uh, to be to be in this section here. And again, this is just to pay recognition that there are other companies out there that are at least trying to do some creative things. Um, there's some really interesting sets here, like um, this old, I think it's probably from World War One or World War Two, probably World War II, um, a trike, you know, here's a car, you know, here's a plane. So there are some companies out there that I think are, are doing the right things. This set should not be in here because that is a complete knockoff of a Lego set. So this <laughs> made its way in here, and, and obviously I did not work on filling out this section. My team did, um, and they are less educated in terms of what set should be here. So we will have to get that poorly <laughs> replicated flat iron building out of there. But some of these other ones are pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, this um, would be an incredible Lego theme right here, something like Romans and Barbarians. Romans, yeah. And then there are other, you know, lines of like knights and different elements. I think it's interesting to see the different elements that some of these other companies make. Um, here's an original Lord of the Rings set. Um, this was made by a company called Playmates. So they actually had the license before Lego obtained it. So it's neat to see what they did. Pirates of the Caribbean is another example. Um, I think Megablocks had that for some time. And I know even things like Spider-Man kind of went back and forth between mm -hmm. some of the companies. Um, that military set will have to come down, as I spoke about earlier. We're going to leave that to Dan Siskin to celebrate. Uh, he is the, the mastermind behind all of that education. Um, so, so we'll. But things that are historic, like this Viking ship here, that's really well done. I think that's really interesting. Um, things like this, where it's a musical instrument mm -hmm. here, you could see. I mean, it's, it's. I think it's well done. I think it's interesting. It's neat. Um, here we've got some original lock blocks. Um, I think that's from the 80s of the original Smurfs. Um, so, so yeah, so we're just, you know, just a hint at some of the other things out there, you know. And then here's the design lab over here, which is not set up at all. We, we don't have our computers in yet to show the terminals of how bricks are designed and shaped. And, and we have, that's a, a 3D printer. Um, here's another 3D printer. Here's a CNC machine here that actually makes the molds. Um, this is another 3D printer, which is a really neat one to see, and it's three axis, and it, it's really cool. And then here we've got a hologram machine that is not on display yet, and but you, it is turned on, so you could kind of mm -hmm. see a, a brick in there. I think we've got floating around in there, um, but this will all be flushed out much better, or flushed out, I should say. And then this here is our injection molding machine, and you can actually see a Lego... Well, I shouldn't say a Lego brick, but a two by four brick that's in their mold. And to distinguish um, the souvenir bricks that come out of the museum um, with the Lego Group's bricks, like earlier what I said was, we will only be producing colors that the Lego Group does not produce. And our stud says B2B as opposed to L-E-G-O. So, and then here's a conveyor belt in the back, the robotic arm. This is not up and running right now. We've had some issues. There's so many issues that <laughs> you know come out but um but yeah this is uh this is a really neat experience and over here um we've got um this is our model shop so this is where i said we'll be having artisans coming in and coming out um to display um their creations and talk about how they build and then we've got these sliding glass doors here that open up and what this does is it allows people to have an exchange with the artist so if they've got questions um if they they need some building techniques and things like that. Um, the artists here will be more than happy to share that with them. And um, yeah, that rounds out uh, the exhibit in the museum space. And then uh, here we, uh, we enter into the gift shop. We're, for the most part, I've hand selected all of the items um, that are available to us um, that I believe in one way or another evoke three-dimensional creativity and the different mediums, um, and again, for all ages. Um, so if you're young, if you're older, if you want, in this case, to learn about structural engineering, or here is actually a game. So not all learning and creativity has to be models you build. That's an actual game that you play. So it's just about finding unique and creative items. You know, here's, here's some interesting design sets. Um, you know, these are just kind of desktop, you know, sculptures that you put together and, and you make. And I think that these evoke 
um, you know, some interesting aspects of the philosophy of design theory. And then back there is some Leonardo da Vinci sets that you get to build and, and be creative so we can also celebrate the artists that came before us, that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's the gift shop. And yeah. over here, uh, so the conveyor belt runs around the outside. And uh, when that's on, you see the little bricks marching along, almost like uh, in a candy factory and seeing, you know, the, the little candies come off the yeah. line. And here is what we're calling our make and take area. And these are 88 tubes. And on this side here is an example of the colors that we've started producing. So if I can grab a brick here, this is actually um, the color. I forget the all the colors are numbered in the Pantone color system. They're not named. But this would be kind of a clay color or a putty. So here's a white to kind of kind of see the difference there. So this is not a gray. It's a, it's like a very light beige or a putty color. And so, um, yeah, so these are here for souvenirs. And then um, that pretty much rounds out. This here is interesting because what we'll do here is... Um, we don't have any areas actually to play with bricks. So we'll leave that up to Legoland since they're experts at that. Mm -hmm. This is really meant to sit down um, and you've got about a half hour to take parts that are in the center. Maybe this month it's Lego bricks. Maybe next month it's Lincoln Logs. Maybe the following month it's Erector Set parts. Um, and then even breaking it down further, maybe one week out of the Lego month is just white pieces. Maybe it's Technic pieces. Well, you make whatever you make, this is called a make and take. So whatever you make, you're gonna take up to the counter, we weigh it, and you pay for it, and you get to take it home with you. So it's kind of just something else that's a complimentary experience that you know you can't find anywhere else. You know, There's a lot of places where you can you know, make things and play with things, but then you have to leave them behind. Here, it's one of those things where you actually take the creation home with you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so that's wonderful to have a more interactive area there as well. And I love the idea of the, the special brick that people can kind of take home as like a memory of their experience here at the museum. Uh, which there's so much to see that's that's definitely impressive so yeah it's a very impressive area that you've set up here i think people will definitely enjoy uh seeing this and exploring the history of lego and, and seeing the different types of construction toys uh that have come along over the years so for people who want to find out more about the museum and are interested in visiting where, where would you send them where do you recommend well, they visit uh, i believe my team just launched our website okay. which is blocks to bricks.com and we also do have a facebook page i am very uh social media illiterate so i'm sure that you guys are smart enough out there to just google it or whatever it is and, and find a way to to get in touch and see what we're about but there is one thing i forgot to share with you and i think we should go and check it out now so the idea behind the vault is i wanted again um visitors and guests to feel um a place where they could go and kind of have an escape from within an escape so you know, I wanted you to feel like when you're in the museum that you forgot that you're in the middle of a mall, first of all, but then um, there's a private collection of, of effects that I have that we didn't really have a good place for out in the museum. The door opens, and right now it's being used for, if you can give me one second mm -hmm. here. Yeah, so if you come in here, you could see that we're using this for storage right now, and there's a door to get into my office down that way, and there's also another door to get into my office this way. So the guest will have to make a decision when they come in here which way they would like to get into my office. And so here we have an arch ceiling in here to kind of make you feel like you're actually in the tunnels of Chicago. So, um, so that's the idea behind this. And uh, if you want to see more, you're going to have to come back and actually experience uh, the vault. Thanks so much for watching our tour of the Blocks to Bricks Museum. And thank you to Adam for showing us around this amazing experience here. I definitely encourage you to come over and check out the museum yourself. If you're ever in the Chicago area, it's well worth a visit. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And I'm glad you guys could join us today for a walk through the tour.